Hi, I'm Dan Robinson with the Great Lakes Spirituality Project. The project works to further develop a spirituality of the lakes that values and protects the Great Lakes Basin and all life that depends on these waters. To accomplish that mission, the project shares stories, conversations, and reflections around the spirituality of the Great Lakes Basin, adds another spiritual voice to the work of protecting the lakes, and serves as a connecting point for spiritual and religious communities and individuals caring for the lakes and the waters that feed them. We want to welcome Ched Myers, who is an author and activist theologian who has worked in social change movements for over 40 years and co-directs with his partner, Elaine Enns, the Bartimaeus Cooperative Ministries in the Ventura River Watershed, which is located in traditional Chumash territory in Southern California. Ched is the editor of the book Watershed Discipleship, Reinhabiting Bioriginal Faith and Practice, which was published in 2016. And he and Elaine are about to publish a new book titled Healing Haunted Histories, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization. So welcome, Ched. Thanks for being here today. The title of your book is Watershed Discipleship. What do you mean by that phrase, watershed discipleship? Here's a... <clears throat> an attempt to, to answer the, the content of the, the vision of this, this book. Um, the, the phrase that we've been using for a little over 10 years in our work here in Southern California, watershed discipleship is a triple entendre. Um, and it seems to be resonating among a lot of faith-rooted activists uh, around North America. And here's the, here's the various uh, meanings. In the, in the first iteration, it recognizes that we are in a watershed moment of historical, social, and ecological crisis. Uh, it also acknowledges that um, any lived faith takes place inescapably in a bioregional context. Uh, and so we are um, disciples in our bioregions or our watersheds. And thirdly, it implies that we also need to become disciples of our watersheds uh, in order to become more deeply literate, more deeply engaged. Um, and so that's, uh, that's kind of the, uh, the gist of, of the vision in a nutshell. Um, so let me just correlate this to what's going on at the moment in our country. Um, obviously, we're in a watershed moment of crisis, um, particularly as it's been in the wake of um, widespread protests across the U.S. and beyond after the police murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis last month. Um, this is not, uh, as I'll say in a minute, the first time that some of us have seen our cities burn because of rage against police violence. Past and present issues of justice for black lives continue to haunt our body politic, a legacy of American apartheid that continues in current disparities in healthcare and economic opportunity as the pandemic has so dramatically revealed. That's why a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Raphael Warnock of Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church, the pulpit where Martin Luther King Jr. served back in the day, called the pandemic a double virus, what he calls COVID-19 and 1619, obviously mm. referring to the disease of racism that landed on the shores of America with the first slave ships 401 years ago. So uh, in the second meaning of watershed discipleship, um, essentially all politics are local. And so we, um, we, we assume that all of us on this call and many of the listeners have been trying to engage uh, and what it means to support black lives in their own particular context. Um, and that's very much part of um, watershed discipleship as we understand it. Here uh, locally in Ventura County, where we are in the Ventura uh, River watershed, um, on Saturday, Elaine was uh, down at uh, City Hall where there was a large demonstration in front of a statue of Father Junipero Serra who was the establisher of the original colonizing missions under the Spanish in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, 
And at that, um, as you see here at that protest, um, an indigenous elder who we work very closely with, Julie Tumamite, um, spoke to, uh, she's in conversation with the city and with the um, pastor of the still existing Catholic mission uh, right next to city hall to try to take down that statue um, by negotiation. Um, indigenous people have long been trying to get the attention of mainstream culture that um, these missions were largely genocidal for the indigenous people of this area and all up and down the California coast. So in the meantime, over the weekend, two statues of uh, Padre Serra came down, one in Los Angeles and one in San Francisco. So all of this obviously is um, following in the wake of um, the animated political imagination um, stemming from the Black Lives Matter movement and that um, that in inertia is flowing into um, indigenous issues, which um, is a topic we wanna uh, definitely wanna get to. Um, and the third iteration um, about becoming disciples in our watersheds, of, of our watersheds, um, a lot of us had the chance to practice the spiritual discipline yesterday of um, commemorating the summer solstice. Uh, this is uh, something that we've done liturgically in the Christian tradition in our place for the last 12 years or so, um, trying to develop that as, a, as an emerging uh, old tradition, uh, re recovery of an old tradition. Uh, and in, in that spirit, in that vein, just wanted to share this amazing um, arbor glyph. An arbor glyph is a carving into a tree. This is a Shumash arbor glyph, probably 200 or more years old, that is in a remote section of the um, mountains in San Luis Obispo County, north of us. Um, and this arbor glyph is, in fact, a solstice calendar um, by which, um, through the movements of certain placement of sticks or through the year, both summer and winter solstice, as well as the two equinoxes, are mapped onto this figure, which some see as a scorpion, but which is actually a representation uh, of the, um, the North Star and the Big Dipper, or uh, the Ursa Major. Uh, so this is a, a reminder to us that existing in the bioregions where we dwell as settlers is an older indigenous wisdom and indeed indigenous science. And we, we uh, had the opportunity yesterday uh, to uh, have on our regular uh, Sunday uh, farm church online liturgy uh, to not only celebrate the solstice, but also celebrate the fact that in Canada yesterday um, was National Indigenous Peoples Day. And so we interviewed this Cree elder, Harry LaFond, um, who is, is a, just a beautiful spiritual person. And he talked to us about the way in which for Plains uh, indigenous people, the Sundance is a way of commemorating um, the spirituality of the solstice. Um, all of that is woven into what we understand bioregionally uh, as an extension of the Black Lives Matter movement, indeed the Native Lives Matter. So that's just a little bit about how how we are trying to understand watershed discipleship in this political moment. And before I turn the mic uh, over to uh, these fine Catholic worker women, um, I'll just try to answer a question that Dan said he wants to ask each of us, which is, how did, how did you come to watershed discipleship? Um, and that brings us to the year 1992, which was the quincentenary, the 500th anniversary of the landing of Columbus on the shores of Turtle Island. Um, that was a real um, uh, watershed moment for me as, as an activist. Um, it was a year in which uh, a lot of us kind of fully turned our attention toward indigenous issues, um, trying to deconstruct the, the Columbus myth, um, toppling statues, as it were, of false consciousness in the American psyche. And uh, in, a, in many ways, uh, the 1992 quincentenary 
uh, around North America and all over the world was um, a, a new wave of indigenous resurgence and activism uh, and cultural renewal, which has continued um, all the way up to the present. And, um, and yet right in the middle of that year of focus, um, <clears throat> I saw my city burn for the second time in my life um, in the 1992 Los Angeles uprising, um, which um, was simply another iteration of police violence against um, black bodies. Uh, the famous um, beating of, of Rodney King by four white police officers, which triggered after those cops were acquitted, uh, triggered the largest civil uprising in the history of the United States. And as I said, the second time that I'd seen Los Angeles burn, city of my birth, um, the first time being the Watts uprising of 1965. It's also where the, the famous moniker, no justice, no peace, uh, became popularized. And of course, we saw that um, again uh, in uh, recent protests. So um, not only for the second time in my life did I see that my city burn, but saw the National Guard occupy and, and then federal troops occupy the city uh, again for the second time in my life. And we, we saw all of this again last month in some of the rage around um, the the most recent string of police public lynchings of African-American men. Um, <clears throat> so this all came um, hard on the heels almost exactly a year later um, from the first Gulf War, which was another apocalyptic moment unveiling the United States yet again as an imperial war machine um, and sort of a new iteration in um, the struggle against the militarized state. Um, and in the midst of that war, um, my father died suddenly, um, just a week after we'd had a huge argument about the war. My dad was my link to five generations here in California. His ancestors dated back to the Mexican period. He was um, half Mexican. And so all of this is happening in 1991, 1992, and, and it's this season of personal and political reckoning for me. Um, during that period, um, I was also reading a lot of Wendell Berry, who has been so important for so many of us. Um, and of course, the, as a Kentucky farmer, um, Berry is the foremost Christian voice addressing our alienation from the land in North America and pressing the diagnosis of the pathology of placelessness. As he puts it in modern globalized capitalism, one must never think of any place as someone's home. One must never think of any place as one's own home. Um, and, and that really got to me as a fifth generation Californian. Um, I was really coming into consciousness, particularly after my dad's passing of my own deep spiritual rootedness in this land of fragile chaparral and oak savanna landscape. It's etched into my soul. Um, and yet, like uh, everyone else, I've seen too much of the land I love relentlessly bulldozed, paved over and disfigured by overdevelopment. Southern California is a place that has been systematically destroyed and mercilessly exploited by resorts and suburban tracks and trophy homes and golf courses and military industrial complexes and all other ma <coughs> manner of development. Most of which frankly has been spearheaded by transplanted people who have come here in pursuit of a fantasy and or corporate interests in search of quick profit. So I, I really came to realize in those years that one of the great continuing sadnesses of my life um, is to watch my home place be destroyed. Um, and it's, uh, I've really struggled with um, feelings of rage and depression around that. I later learned um, that there's a word for this uh, coined by eco-psychologists called solastalgia, the condition of being homesick in one's own home place because of all the degradation. 
So all of that is to say that in 91 and 92, um, I, I was working against the war. I was working against police violence um, for justice as well as peace. I was working um, you know, against the Columbus mythology uh, in solidarity with indigenous movements. Um, but the question that kept bubbling up for me is, so, so what am I for? What, what do I say yes to? What is, what is a vision of life and place? Um, and, and that is, uh, Dan, what brought me to um, the vision of bioregionalism. I started reading, bioregionalism was, was a movement that was widespread, um, kind of being spearheaded in Cascadia or the Pacific Northwest, inspired by indigenous cosmologies. Um, and uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I immersed myself in this literature and found like, okay, so this is, this is a paradigm that is both a spiritual framework, a political framework, an economic framework, an ecological framework that, that I could say yes to. And I was really excited to uh, come out in 1994 with the publication of this book as a bioregionalist. Um, this was a follow-up on my study of Mark's gospel, Finding the Strongman, and uh, I was so excited um, about the conversation that might come from uh, saying yes to bioregionalism as an alternative politics, and uh, um, that was a great les lesson in humility because it was, <laughs> nobody was interested. Nobody uh, really picked up on, <laughs> on this, um, and, and that was fine, you know, because this was my journey, and I... Um, continued to deepen it through my own disciplines and, and building of literacy in my own place. Um, it was uh, about 15 years later that I met Brock Dolman, a, a um, perm permaculturist um, and ecological restorationist who's in Northern California. And he's the one who kind of boiled down the bioregional paradigm to a watershed paradigm. Uh, and by that time we had moved um, up to the Ventura River watershed uh, and, and that is just where it all came together. And, and so I sort of made another push to see if people in, in faith-based justice movements might be interested in this ecological, social, political um, framework. And this time around, there was a lot of resonance. Um, and so that's, that's how um, about 10 years later, we came to publish this book, which is um, really a conversation with a number of younger activists. This is a generation, right, that has grown up with climate catastrophe, grown up with ecological crisis. And so uh, I'm finding that um, now, un unlike 30 years ago, there's a lot more openness to bioregionalism and watershed paradigms. So I'll just um, end by saying, um, you know, our slogan today is one that we borrow from the great Senegalese environmentalist, Baba Dioum, who more than 50 years ago um, really put it, as Wendell Berry would say, as a crisis of affection. And he points out that we won't save places that we don't love. And we can't love places that we don't know. And we don't know places that we haven't learned. Um, and this really for us is, is sort of the essence of a watershed pedagogy and practice and discipleship um, to learn our places enough to know them, enough mm. to truly love them so that we can struggle to save them and we might add to be saved by them. Um, so kind of back to the present, I really like how Adrian Marie Brown puts it, you know, for all the crisis that we're in the middle of, Things aren't getting worse, she says. They're getting uncovered. Appropriately, appropriately apocalyptic image. So let us hold each other tight and continue to pull back the veil.